We are in Luke's gospel today, Luke chapter 14. Go ahead and turn there. So I've entitled this message RSVP. Familiar with that? Well, I don't know if you know where it comes from. It, it really does mean what we know it to mean, that is reply, please, so that we know you're coming to my event, RSVP, right? But here it goes. You ready for this? Responde s'il vous plaît. How's that? I don't know if anyone speaks French here, but you can come and crit me afterwards if you like. But that's where it comes from. Respond if you please. And we know how we use it. Hosts would send out an, a little invitation at first. So this is important to, to remember, this illustration. Invitation goes out, and then there's a request for an RSVP. The event comes later. After preparations are made, of course, then you arrive at the event. Got that? That's how RSVP works. And I think in this text, we're going to be exposed a little bit to what that's all about. So it begins with a meal, a dinner, and Jesus is invited to the home of a ruler of the Pharisees. So we are in a sermon series right now where we are connecting all the four Gospels together. We are harmonizing those together, and we have broken that massive study into six portions, and we write toward the end. Well, we, we are, in terms of the, the series, we're near, near the end, but we are probably two-thirds of the way there. And we are in a portion that we've entitled penultimate, leading up to the cross. So we've come through Easter. Keep that in your mind because there's going to be lots of reference back to the finished work of Jesus in this text even. And now we get back into this normal routine of our church life where we are harmonizing the Gospels together. We find ourselves in Luke 14. He's the only one, Luke, who records this event of the dinner. So Jesus has a dinner with the ruler of the Pharisees, and we know who these guys are. They are the religious of the religious, proudly religious, meaning we are the ones that keep the law of God perfectly. We've got it together, okay? We wear all the robes. We don't do any work on the Sabbath, for example. That's something specific to this passage. And so we are proudly, proudly religious. But if you remember where we were, when we were last in this sermon series, we have seen how the Pharisees have been rising up to plot and to make attempts and plans to kill Jesus. So that's the context of what's going on. So when I read this first, I'm thinking, what is this? Is this like a reconciliation dinner? We want to make friends with Jesus? But then, verse 1, I read of a certain man that is put before Jesus. Have a look at those verses there. As I preach through this passage, glance your eyes over this narrative, the storyline of what's going on. And we are in full... We are met there with a, a person that's brought to Jesus, and of course, now we realize it's not so much that it is a reconciliation dinner, but very much the opposite. In this VIP moment, where all the fancies are brought together, the Lani's have come together for this dinner, um, we meet Jesus, and that's the overarching title for our massive study in the Gospels, to meet Jesus. And my attempt has been as a preacher to really bring out Jesus in each of these sermons. So if you're a guest today, that's where we are, and that's what we are doing in this study. So let's take a look at Jesus in these 24 verses. Number one, Jesus exalts the humble. Verse 1 through to 11, I believe, speaks of this action of Jesus generally, but we see it in the passage of Him exalting the humble. Now, of course, the opposite is true, or the other side of the coin is true, that Jesus also opposes the proud, namely the Pharisees. So now I want to paint the picture of the scene a little bit more. Invitation to supper with the enemy. How do I know it's the enemy? Well, let's go back to that person that was put in front of Jesus. He is a very sick man. The Bible translates his sickness as dropsy. I don't want to get hung up on that. This is a doctor speaking, by the way. Luke is a doctor, so he knows what he's doing. But he, apparently, according to commentaries and others that have looked at the wording and all that, he was visibly sick. And that's the important part. He was swollen. Parts of his body were swollen. And so I think, I don't know if you would like to agree with me or not, but I think this is a trap. I think this is a plot. We're going to see what Jesus is going to do. This is the Sabbath again. And we're going to see what Jesus is going to do with this sick guy that is put in front of him. So what came to mind was that little bracelet. What would Jesus do? Now, we know what Jesus is going to do right now. He's going to heal the sick guy. That's what he's going to do. We've seen it happen. If you do your counting in this series already, 
Seven times before, Jesus has done this. Sick person brought in front of him, he's going to heal immediately. And so the temptation, the test, the plot, the trap is set, and we know what Jesus is going to do. But to begin with, Jesus now addresses the crowd. Now, these are the guys that know the ceremonial law. The plot is to catch him breaking that ceremonial law, meaning to do something active and by way of work and healing on the Sabbath. Picture this, people milling around. They haven't sat down yet. So it's just kind of through the entrance, greeting everybody, milling around. The connection is made. Sick guy, Jesus. Jesus makes this little announcement. It's almost like he, I'm, I'm not reading into the passage here, but in our context, he taps the glass, you know. Ding, 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 gets everyone's attention. The room settles down, and Jesus says, uh, by the way, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And you can almost hear the gasps or the crickets, right? Like, what do you mean? This is like the religious leaders. Of course it's not okay to heal on the Sabbath. So there's this incredible pressure of silence right in the beginning of the text. And Jesus is almost saying, you guys are the professionals. You tell me what I'm supposed to do. But there's no reply. They would not reply because Jesus had pushed them into a corner. If they said yes... They would be saying, well, then just break our law. If they said no, then of course they would be disregarding this man and his desperate need, which was obvious and public, and they would be showing their not compassion for this man, which would be unacceptable as well. So they were in a corner and didn't have anything to say, so they remained silent. So look what Jesus did, exactly what I said. He took the man, healed the man, and sent him on his way. Why? Because he needed to protect the man as he was one of their little, you know, pawns to be used to trap Jesus, and at the same time, disarm the trap and get that entirely out of this dinner. I mean, it would have been such a horrible moment for those that have put all the details together and organized and arranged all this big trap and everything, now to have it all completely diffused. Notice how quickly Jesus did this immediately in your Bible, immediately it was done, done, dusted, easy. Healing for Jesus, absolutely easy. Notice this. That's not the focus, though, of what the passage is about. Now that that's out the way, Jesus has a whole evening to address this crowd, and he does so. Come on, guys, is that it? Is that the best that you can do? If one of your sons or one of your animals fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you immediately go and rescue your son or rescue your animal? And again, there is silence in the room. It must have been so awkward. I mean, you could cut the tension with a knife. Silence again, this time because they could not reply, Jesus had trapped them. It's amazing how skilled and, and, and precise Jesus was with his wording. I mean, these leaders had missed the mark completely. They had considered themselves to be spiritual and holy and devout, keeping all the laws, especially God's laws regarding the Sabbath. And yet, Jesus points out that their treatment of their own animals was better than their treatment of a needy, desperate man. Well, at that point, it's almost like somebody in the crowd said, well, the dinner's ready, let's have a seat to try and diffuse the tension. And so they do, they start taking their seats. And this is also something that Jesus uses for some further instruction. Because they start rushing for their seats, for the special places, and here's the custom. Um, you can do some research on this by yourself, but apparently the seating around tables was very important and there were certain places of honor. For example, the middle seat apparently of three would be a place of honor, to the left would be place number two, and then spot number three would be on the right of that honored person. So here we have a crowd running for these positions, probably because they want to score another meal in the future, you know, rise up the, the social, cali- you know, social ladder a little bit and, and get some place of prominence, and they were earning that for themselves, their right in this particular party scenario. And again, Jesus grabs the opportunity, and you hear that same glass, ding, ding, ding. I mean, the crowd are thinking, who invited this guy? I mean, every time we have a moment to get the meal on the go, and we're starting to get everything arranged, he has to interrupt with something that's very awkward, you know? It's exactly what Jesus did. And he uses an illustration of a wedding to point out something. He says, when you go to a wedding, talking to the guests there, everybody, he says, when you go to a wedding, don't take the places of honor for yourself. Rather take a seat of least honor and allow the guest the opportunity to promote you. And it's no different for us today in culture. Let me give you some advice. When you go to a wedding, you know that long table up front with the big flowers and don't go sit there. (laughs) 
Because somebody's going to walk in the room, a, a bride or a groom, probably not the bride, but hopefully the groom or the groomsman, and say, listen, listen, you're in the wrong seat. But then all the other seats are taken, and it's going to be awkward, right? Rather sit somewhere else and have that groom come and say, you know what, Mr. Jones, would you join me at a place of honor at the table up front? And that's exactly the illustration that Jesus used in this situation. So we make some application. Our place of honor depends on the host, capital H. In life, church, our place of honor depends on our host, who is Jesus, not us. Not us. We must be warned by a passage like this not to exalt yourself. God is the judge. He, he is the one that needs to be left alone to do the exalting. I mean, I think other passages, New Testament, James chapter 4, verse 6, it's almost the exact same words as what Jesus used on this occasion. Because no doubt, James, using the Proverbs, Tying it into this, oh, it's, the, Bible, the Bible blows me away, okay? But James says these words, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This is the theology of what Jesus was saying on this occasion. And it all goes back, by the way, to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. Toward the scorners, he is scornful, but to the one who is humble, he gives favor. This is established in the word of God. And the crowd should have known this if there were such professionals at God's word, the scribes and the Pharisees. And there's so many examples in the Bible. William Hendrickson does a beautiful poetic um, job at, at tying some of these examples together. Like, for example, those that would exalt themselves, like Nabal. Remember him? Remember Jezebel fell from top floor? Dogs had to lick her blood. Remember Herod? Tried to elevate himself as well and ended up being eaten by worms. I mean, these are, these are serious ends to life as God has stepped in to humble those that have taken places of honor for themselves. But then, of course, the opposite is true as well. There are many examples in Scripture of those that have humbled themselves, and God has exalted them. God has shown favor to them, like Hannah, 1 Samuel chapter 1, Mary, little teenage girl used by God, Paul. I mean, these are those that have humbled themselves before God and God has raised them up as great leaders worthy of honor. Now, because of the context, I wrote a few notes down for myself. Uh, being a, a religious leader in some ways, there's some application here that is direct and kind of touches a nerve with me. So in my notes, I wrote down some a personal note of application for me and I wonder if you would like to pray and, and join me in praying this for yourself. Trent. All right, Trent. Apply this to your ministry. Pray for humble trust in God and a keenness to do His will. No glory for yourself, no boasting, and no pride. That's my note. And I wondered by way of application if that wouldn't be a prayer that you'd like to pray for yourself. You know, I, I want to be about humility and trusting and depending on God and at the same time, I want to have an eagerness and a zeal to do what God wants me to do. But I don't want to be that guy running for the place of honor and jumping into this, onto the stage of glory and fame and boasting and pride. I rather want to be the one that humbles myself. Amen? So Jesus is the one who exalts the humble. Secondly, Jesus repays the generous Jesus repays the generous, verses 12 through to 15. Jesus then speaks to the host. So get this little glance of our shift. The whole crowd, the host is sitting there probably thinking, man, this is going pear-shaped in a hurry. Our plan is now diffused and my guests are frustrated and I'm just, you know, a little bit embarrassed. Jesus looks him in the eye, the host, and he says, I've got something for you as well, Mr. Host. When you prepare a dinner and you prepare a banquet, there is something very important that you need to discover, and that is blessing. Find it in your Bible where it's referred to there in this text. You need to discover the blessing of giving to those who cannot reciprocate. You need to invite to your banquet the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. And there will be a reason for this, because you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just and the righteous. Verse 14. 
Have a look at that. Find, the, find verse 14 there in your passage. You will be repaid one day at the resurrection of the just and the righteous. Wow, this is deep. And I hope that God gives me grace now to, uh, I don't know, allow this passage, relay this passage to you in the way it was a blessing to me this week. At first glance, when I read what Jesus had to say there to the host, I would apply it very simply, and probably the, the way that you've replied or applied it to your life um, to this point. Obviously, we need to learn from what Jesus said to serve others unselfishly, and you will be rewarded in the end, okay? So we, we think about our lives, and we think, yes, I must reach out to the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and in reaching out to those that would never be able to reciprocate, I one day will have my repayment. I will be rewarded one day. And we think glory, right? And we should. We should think glory in terms of our selfless service of others that are less fortunate than ourselves. I mean, I think our famous passage is like Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus had some things to say as well. The king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed, same word, blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You remember this passage? So here's the reward. It's all happening right here. For I was hungry and you gave me food, thirsty and you gave me a drink, stranger, you welcomed me in, I was naked, you clothed me, I was sick and in prison and you came to visit me. And they answer saying, when did we do that? And Jesus says, yeah, well, we, you did it when you did it to the least of my brothers. That's when you did it to me. And Jesus was saying, you need to reach out to those that are less fortunate and show favor and grace to them and you will be rewarded. So this is steadfast truth at first glance that we must apply. Serve others unselfishly and you will be rewarded. But at second glance, there's something far deeper and such a blessing. And verse 15 is the place that I want you to look at. Find verse 15 where it says these words. A random guest stands up at the banquet now and says something to Jesus. Yes, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Blessed is everyone, same word, this is the blessing you're talking about, Jesus, is everyone who will eat bread now looking to the future, to the reward. And he made a connection that I believe we need to make right now in terms of a much deeper application of this point. That there is a bigger and greater banquet coming. I mean, I didn't think of it. This random guest thought about it, one of the religious professionals, in fact, stood up and said, yeah, there's a bigger banquet coming. We're gonna eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, think about this. If the reality is that if you are going to that banquet, well, let me say it this way. If you are attending that banquet that he spoke about here, the one in glory, the wedding feast of the Lamb, if you wanna be specific, you will be in the same kind of boat as those that Jesus referenced to. You would have at some point been extended an invitation. You would have RSVP'd to that invitation. We, we would, I would refer to that in terms of this context as conversion. I have signed up for glory. I have committed my life to the Lord and said, God, yes, I'll, I want to be at your banquet one day. That's what conversion is all about, coming to Christ, surrendering your life to Him in faith and repentance. And I would call that the RSVP. And so we've rep replied to Jesus saying, sign me up for that. And the beauty of this passage speaks of this incredible scene of those at the banquet being the ones who are the needy, you and me, the crippled, the blind, the lame, and the poor. Those that are, in some way, I would speak spiritually to say, those that are undeserving to have a seat of honor at the banquet. Amen? I know I speak of myself in that way. Surely one day I'll feel the same way. Me? At the banquet? What a blessing. And this is the discovery that has to be made. When you extend an invitation to those that are in need, man, you will reply some kind of answer like this. Who, me? No way, buddy, you're the wrong guy. I haven't got clothes for that banquet. I, I could never repay you. I could, I could never take the host out and reciprocate the same gesture of favor to him. I've never been treated this way before. Are you getting the storyline? That's exactly how we're gonna feel one day 
when we turn up at the banquet. What a blessing. And so what Jesus was saying to the host is this generosity of God, as we apply this, this generosity of God ought to be tasted in our generosity toward others that need grace. The blind and the lame and the crippled and the poor. Wow, that's quite a big fuel. I'll put that another way. I'll say our hospitality, our kindness, our grace, our generosity is fueled, church family, by a greater banquet. That's the blessing that fuels our gestures of kindness and grace and hospitality toward others. Jesus exalts the humble. And secondly, Jesus repays the generous. One more. Jesus welcomes the needy. Jesus welcomes the needy. Now look how this ends. Jesus tells another parable. The man, a man gave a banquet, a great banquet, and invited many. The time for the banquet arrived, and he sent out an announcement to his invited guests. Take a pen and underline this announcement in your Bible. Come, for everything is now ready. Now, this is how it worked. It's, it's quite simple to understand. It's very similar to actually to today. We, we would have an idea to host a banquet, a great you know, get, gathering of friends and family and hopefully those that wouldn't expect to be invited in light of this passage. And we would send out an invitation. Something like a save the date would go out and along with that some kind of invitation with an RSVP. Jesus was speaking here of the need for the host to know the numbers of people that were coming. That's what RSVP is all about. So the invitation goes out way before the event. The numbers and the RSVP come back. The catering begins on the day, right? Now think, agrarian society, you've got slaughtering of animals and all that has to go on. I mean, this is a massive rigmarole to have a feast. That's the word that's used in the text. A feast like this would have taken some time. And nobody knows how long. Because there's lots of obstacles in terms of getting this kind of thing put together. So what happens then is when the meal is coming to being ready, the messengers go out to go and tell the guests who have RSVP'd, it's time. They get ready, they turn up, and everyone has a feast together. Not very different to what we do today. And the message has these words in it. Come, for everything now is ready. Look at those words. Come, for everything is now ready. But in the parable, the host at that point starts getting dropped by his guests who have RSVP'd. One by one, they start bringing their lame excuses. They're the ones that have said, I'm coming, listen, I'm coming, but they don't turn up. Very important to understand the sequence of events here so that we can ma make the right application. I, I don't know if you've been in this position. Uh, I certainly have, and it hurts, right? I mean, I've just prepared the meal. The stuff's in the oven. The meal, I mean, the decorations are on the table. And we've put effort and investment and love and care. And now you're telling me you're not going to come? It hurts. That's why we consider it to be a, a faux pas in terms of etiquette to break an RSVP in this way. Look at the reaction of the host in the passage now. It's almost like we can feel it. The host is angry, man. The host is angry. His preparations are not going to go to waste. No ways. Sends his messengers out again. He says, you know what? Fill these seats. Go to the city. Find it in the text. You'll find it right there. Go to the lanes and the streets of the city and fill up these seats. Messengers come back and say, well, we filled up the seats from the city. There's still room. Go out again. Go beyond the city. Go into the rural areas, to the shanties, those that have built their houses among the hedges. Find it in your Bible. And bring, that's the word that's used, bring those people to the banquet. Later on, another word is used. Compel those people to come to the banquet. Can I take an aside real quick? Not the focus of the sermon, but definitely a thrust in the passage is our evangelism. It's going to the highways and the byways and it's bringing people to the banquet. You know why? They can't believe they've been invited. They can't understand how I am going to fit into this whole church thing. 
They need to be held by the hand and brought to church. In their conversations, they need to be compelled and reasoned with to partake in what has been extended to them as an invitation from the host, Jesus Christ, to a banquet in heaven. There's lots to be said around this, the bringing and the holding of the hand, the compelling, to, to, to help people at work and at school to come to Christ. It's an invitation that they can't really understand. Like, who, me? You got the wrong guy. I don't have clothes for this. I hope we can learn as a church to hold somebody by the hand and bring them to Christ. And in conversation, compel them with the arguments of the Scripture to Christ, that they are in fact the ones that have been invited by the King of Kings to a banquet. And may this picture grab our hearts in terms of our effort here. Go again, church family. And if it doesn't work in one certain area of the city, go somewhere else, but fill the seats. Are you with me? Fill the seats. The same crowd as mentioned, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And it's at this point that Jesus drops a bomb in the parable. Bang! In verse 24. For I tell you, that's what he says, none of those men who are invited initially, shall taste my banquet. There's a lot going on in that statement. Take a pen so you understand this text in the future. The you is in the plural. I tell you. Jesus now takes his eyes off the host and talks to the crowd again. There's a change of leaving the parable behind to now address the crowd, and the bomb that explodes at this point is the little word my. This banquet is mine. So what Jesus was saying was, this isn't just a story. This is the truth. And I am the host. Not this guy I'm looking at. I'm the host. Got it? Church family, if we don't know these details about the Bible and you don't read your Bible with accuracy like this, you're not going to make the right application. Because at this point, this passage forces us to make application that we did not have before. Before it was Jesus and the host, and what's he gonna do to be a better host in a banquet situation? Now it's Jesus and you and me. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna make some application, you got it? Now I've made this application for myself already. I wanna reel you in. Firstly, what excuses are you using at the moment to not accept the invitation of Jesus to his banquet. I, I don't know what they are. You do, but I want to say all of them are lame. I, I want to put it into terms that you can understand. We've got to watch out for distractions of the world because when I read these very carefully and I started to understand the nuances of each one, they're all attractions of the world that have taken God's place. So, this invitation has arrived, and, and, and I'm sure that most of you have heard the gospel. You've, you've received your invitation. That's what it's all about. The good news of Easter last weekend, Jesus dying in your place so that you can have forgiveness and eternal life. Banquet. That is the news of Jesus' redemption that I'm sure most here listening online as well have heard. Invitation. But, sadly, there are things that crop up in life that distract from that invitation. You want to know them in common terms? The first one would sound something like this. Thanks, God, for your invitation, but I've got to go and buy something. Look at it. I've got to go and buy something new. And how true this is of our world. Thank you, God. I, you know, I want to live for you, and I appreciate the invitation to a banquet in heaven, but right now I'm distracted with something new to buy. Wealth and pleasure being the big categories that haunt us in terms of excuses to RSV to this, this banquet invitation. Second one would be something like this. Thanks, God, for your invitation, but I've got to test drive something. Can you believe it? It's in the Bible, 2,000 years old. There it is. I've just bought some livestock. This is the actual story, and I've got to go and test to make sure that they all work. Sounds very familiar to the stories that I hear today, the excuses that I hear from people in terms of something that's distracting them from heeding 
and receiving and RSVPing to the invitation to a banquet in glory. So sad. I've got something I need to test drive. A new toy, a new car, a new boat. I don't know. Something's going to bring you pleasure. You know it's true. The third one sounds something like this. Lord, thank you for the invitation, but I've got something else, something new to do, and something new I want to enjoy by way of a thrill or a pleasure. And if you really look at life, Jesus nailed it in his parable. Because he's received so many excuses through the years, he can lump them into these two massive categories, wealth and pleasure. And how sad it is that so many have received an invitation, some have even replied, RSVP'd, insincerely and will not be sitting at the banquet one day because of these distractions. So to take it further, my application would be something like this. Does your life prove that you've sincerely RSVP'd for that banquet in glory? Are you going to be there one day? Everyone listening, are you going to be there? Because I would like to see you there. I'd like you to know with certainty today that you've RSVP'd, meaning there's been a time in my testimony where I've committed my life to Christ. And the results of that conversion, that being born again, has radically altered the trajectory of my life. So now, today, looking back on that event, I am assured that I have a seat. Is that you this morning? Because the work is done, the preparations have all been made according to this passage. We looked at that last weekend at Easter. But Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Quoting back to a psalm that said the words, it is done. This is the preparation that's been made. The cross is behind us, church. Easter is behind us. And so what we do now is we stay in this this little time zone right now between cross and banquet And it's at this time that we are awaiting the famous words to come from Jesus. Come, for everything is now ready. And let me just warn you, that come, everything is now ready, could happen today when your heart stops working. Could happen tomorrow on the streets when you have an accident in the car. Jesus could return this week. Could happen for all of us. We are not guaranteed of the timing, but here we sit, waiting for the banquet, right? What a beautifully crafted parable. The work is done. The joy for me is that the banquet hall will be full. It'll be full of all those, to use a surfing term, that are stoked to be there. Those that can't get over the fact that they got an invitation in the first place. Those that have been looking forward to the banquet since they got the invitation, they've RSVP'd, whether it be walking an aisle or praying with a family member or making a commitment to Christ, reading the scriptures, talking with their pastor. There are all sorts of different ways to to reply to the Lord in terms of an RSVP, but they've made that RSVP sincerely. And out of respect for the host, when he calls one day, they will be there. You know that old hymn? When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. The RSVP is not a false RSVP or insincere RSVP, but one that is sincere with all of their heart. Now, if you've accepted Jesus' offer of invitation and his offer of salvation, we currently wait. The Bible says we long. Those, if I remember correctly, those who long for his appearing. Who, me? I don't deserve this. We wait for those words, come, for everything is now ready. Won't you bow your heads with me for a minute? We're going to stop the recording at this point and just talk face to face, heart to heart.